Welcome back, everybody. We are going to start into the last round, if you want, of today's agenda on the world situation of capitalism, a feminist perspective of capitalist notions, or rather the connections and intersections of patriarchal structures and capitalism. That's our focus this afternoon. And on the one hand, we shall be looking at topics and discussions from our discussions today about political economy and post-colonialism, and we'll pick them up and give them the feminist spin, if you want. But on the other hand, we'll also confront them with rather fundamental feminist objections and measure them against feminist expectations of a more just and fairer future. So. We make the whole thing even more complicated this afternoon. My name is Uta Rupert. I'm a political scientist at the University of Frankfurt, and I preferably deal with the feminist perspective on the policies of the South South, South North, and global relations. And it's especially and precisely in that function in which I've been cooperating in different forms and formats with Medico International. Sitting here this afternoon is actually a privilege as such because I've got real people around me, which these days is a pleasure in itself. Rita Segado, our speaker of this afternoon, I have the pleasure of announcing her and then of moderating the panel with her and Eva von Redeker. And that, to me, is a particular left-wing feminist honor and pleasure. Let me put it like that. And I'm very much looking forward to the next hour and a half. Rita Segado. My dear, dear Rita, very warm welcome indeed. He, she belongs to one of the most important public feminist intellectuals in South America. And as such, she's very closely connected to the emancipatory feminist indigenous South American movements. And her voice is heard both on behalf of the scientific, but also has a lot of weight for the broad-based public discourse. She has substantial part in the public debate about the effect of feminist mass movements in the Southern Americas. And not least of all, the Chilean collective called La Tesis is well known worldwide with its worldwide performances, El Viador Eres Tu, which was very much based on her work. In scientific terms, Rita Segado for decades worked as a professor of anthropology, mostly in Brazil. Her focus was mostly on the connections and interconnections of gender, violence, and interracial connections. She has a long list of publications, a large number of books as well, which deal in different ways with gender and violence, war against women, but also the decolonialization of analytical thinking and universities. One of her latest publications from 2018 will appear in German in May, titled Wieder die Grausamkeit, Against Cruelty, to be published by Mandelbaum in Vienna. The original title is uh, the counter pedagogics of cruelty. As I said, available in German as of May. And the subtitle of that book says, For a Feminist and Decolonial Way, again refers back to her criticism of the violence of oppression and subjectivation and her thinking in terms of feminist ways out into the future. And we are very much looking forward to hearing an excerpt from her current considerations. And dear Rita, once again, a very warm welcome. And now the floor is yours. First of all, I need to switch off my German translation here. Let me check briefly. Where is it? There we are. Sorry about that. Now, good afternoon to you in Frankfurt. 
whatever time it is at your place, anybody, to everybody who's dialed in. And normally, it is not my habit, but I've actually prepared a text that I'd like to read out. The title is in English, The Risk is Unreal, or The Risk of the Unreal. And I'm now reading. David Leonard tells in yesterday's New York Times, that is February 12, 2021, that the University of Berkeley took more severe measures to control possible COVID infections, for example, by prohibiting outdoor physical exercise, even with a mask. And this is justified with the following phrase, the risk is real. I would like to take this statement, the risk is real, and analyze it and the necessity of this affirmation. It's a classic Freudian denial. This sentence, the risk is real, has to be stated with emphasis because to many the risk is unreal, as the sentence and the phrase and the emphasis illustrate. This phrase presumes what I just want to examine in this lecture, this stupid disbelief in death, which affects the mentality of our time. Characteristics of the pandemic. This pandemic that affects us and shakes all of our beliefs and also the ideological formation that has very much formatted our psyche and our cognition differs from previous pandemics because it combines two characteristics. First, contagion is not zoned. This pandemic is universal because it shows that we are all vulnerable, that the threat is far spread and generalized. And of course, countries with their national fortunes buy vaccines and people with personal fortunes buy the possibility of isolation and of having inputs quality treatment of the disease. But even so, this pandemic stands out because its focus has not affected one region mostly, such as, for example, Ebola or malaria, and also not a particular group like HIV, AIDS. The most powerful in the nation in the world has been hit hardest. We all know why, but that is not actually the topic to be discussed here this afternoon. The richest and most democratic continent in terms of public health has suffered a great loss of lives. People of fame, of power, of fortune and prestige have been infected and some of them have not returned. The pandemic has shown that political borders are not biological borders in this instance, and it will continue to show it, despite of what has been called vaccine apartheid. Because in nations lacking vaccines, the virus can mutate through paths outside the spaces protected by vaccination and can return. This pandemic occurs at a time when what I've elsewhere called Western control neurosis had reached a peak. The disrespect for time, the disbelief in the historical nature of everything that exists, the Cartesian extremism, the belief that just as the head is outside the res extensor, the human being is outside his environmental niche. And from that outside, exercises definitive control over the history of all living things and therefore over life. The pandemic happens to a human being, and that's different from previous pandemics, that is expatriated from life, who's in a self-inflicted exile from the inevitably erratic course of all that is vital, the course of life. And thus, it cancels everything that is indeterminate and uncertain. Now, the combination of these two characteristics of the contemporary pandemic event destabilizes the beliefs of our age. They are part of the great scanner that, in the form of the pandemic, flies over the world, showing the hidden structure, its skeleton. It's something like an 
eruption of the real. It corrodes the fantasy of omnipotence, which is typical of the apocalyptic final capitalism of our time. It could lead to a reset, to a reinitialization. But it is within the system itself that we have the antidote. An antidote against this revolutionary skill that this pandemic proves to have. It is within our system itself. It's already there. Now about the fatal disbelief that we die. Some aspects of the pandemic itself feed the distance and the disengagement with the transition which is inherent in the decay of life. The contact we have with this experience is televised, is mediatic, is telematic. We experience it everywhere. And unlike in all previous epidemics, we do not actually see people die. And nor is death fit to be represented in the perform in the plastic arts. It's not pictorial. It cannot be rendered in statues. The process of dying equally is not exposed or recorded in paintings and pictures that will pass through time as was the case with the classical plagues of the past. We do not see death arrive in the suffering, stained, sore bodies, nor does our gaze rest on corpses disfigured by pain and disease. All we see is aseptic hospital facilities and the sick connected to machines and enclosed by plastic partitions, distance. At the most, we see coffins on cemeteries already crosses in the graves. This also affects us at a time when virtuality has taken over communication and even makes use of it so that many of us can work. Virtuality has become an imperative. Already 25 years ago, in 1995, when what was then called chat rooms had only just been invented, I spent a few months observing the conversations there on what was apparently an innocent topic, religion. And I concluded that virtuality would have a bad effect on sociability. The interactions I observed and accompanied in that early period of virtuality revealed the omnipotent character of the contemporary internet-using subject and his telescoping to his capacity on, of looking on something from afar. In my analysis, the possibility of pretending that the body can be discursively invented in the cybernetic environment gives rise to a feeling of omnipotence and multiplies the aggressiveness of the subject. And this contemporary symptom, that's what I concluded in that text from the time, results from the pretension of the interlocutors in cyberspace to dialogue as if the body did not exist. This is a specificity of the contemporary Western subject, akin to certain types of technologies, both communication and warfare. And they promote or facilitate such a positioning of subject that they can pretend not to feel the limits imposed by the materiality of bodies. And that is their own bodies and those of others. And that is because the body is the first other, the first experience of the limit, the first scene of incompleteness and lack. And when this limit is forecluded, and this forclusion is even potentiated and stressed and uh, exacerbated by a technological device, then all other forms of otherness cease to constitute the limit which the subject needs to qualify literally as a social subject. We are faced with a regressive reality, a consequence of the narcissistic fantasy of completeness and of the refusal to recognize oneself as emasculated, limited by materiality, which is the very index of finitude. A body that exists only as a fantasy, the creation of an omnipotent ego and an larger-than-life ego cannot be thought of as a mortal body. And we are thus approaching another dimension of the present, which I have referred to as the pedagogy of cruelty. 
This idea, misread by many as simply the multiplication and increase of violence against women or the omnipresence today of scenes of cruelty, has a different and a more precise foundation. And above all, it has a history. The history of the continent that presented itself as a territory to be appropriated before the greedy gaze of the conqueror. Thus, the world emerges as an object of usurpation and hoarding. And the pedagogy of cruelty is nothing else but any action that trains and accustoms to transform life into a thing, to perceive life as a thing and to treat life as a thing. The nature thing, the body thing. The world is thus experienced to be owned in a progressive transit towards a present in which to speak of inequality is not enough because what we are talking about is ownership. In other words, the pedagogy of cruelty is that which models subjectivity in order to trap it in a psychopathic personality structure. And that is to say, a personality with a very low capacity for bonding because after all, we do not bond with things unless it's a prosthesis for ourselves that we use to reconfirm ourselves. The psychopathic modeling of sensibility constitutes the modal personality of our time because it's so useful for the historical project of capital in its contemporary face. And that is why it is possible to say that the pedagogy of cruelty is what programs us to reduce the threshold of sensitivity to the suffering of others. Things do not suffer and they do not die. Things get old, things are appropriated, are used, are consumed. And what's left is only remains, is waste. Not to be honored as corpses in funerary rituals, but rather leftovers of that consumption abandoned in garbage dumps. The most precise symptom of this effect on programming the personality by the pedagogy of cruelty is its effect on the lives of women and children, boys and girls, in the form of rape, pedophilia, the groping of bodies, the perverse exploration of limits, Ciudad Juarez, Ayotzinapa, and the feminicides that increase throughout our continent of conquest and reification. It is not death, it is simply appropriation and consumption in a world split between two great historical projects of satisfaction, or goals of satisfaction, which are, on the one hand, the historical striving for things and the historical striving for bonds. The historical striving for things goes on from filling the legend of King Midas going through the landscape, making them become inert, lifeless, until the subject looked at becomes lifeless itself. Everything is gold, everything is a thing, until there is no life left whatsoever. The historical project of bonds, or the historical striving for bonds, is trying to reinstitute jointness. Contemporary life is amphibious, we cannot deny that. We are traveling both paths every day, but at the end of the day, it's the guillotine that falls, and one or the other wins out. Because these two paths or ways are incompatible and are also heading at very distant and different destinations. People with local and communal roots are well aware of these differences and they spend things on preserving their ties. They, for example, have festivals, rituals, and mass satieties, in turn, give up bonds in order to acquire things. In the world of things, death does not exist. One does not believe in death, because to believe in death, one would first have had to believe in life. I'd like to follow with some examples, by way of which I was able to perceive the effect on my generation on the progressive exposure to the pedagogy of cruelty. The film A Clockwork Orange is one which I've already covered elsewhere 
And when it came out, it was the most cruel film of all time. It is based on Anthony Burgess's novel, which he wrote, uh, wrote inspired by the gang rape of his pregnant wife by American soldiers in London during the Second World War. It also was the most censored film in the history of cinema. Even in Great Britain itself, where the novel was written and the film was actually filmed. Just like the protagonist, the British actor Malcolm McDowell said during an interview, these days it's hardly, uh, it's almost considered a comedy. So what has happened in the time in between? What has happened to us? Why is it and how is it and how did it happen that our sensitivity has become so blunt over the 40 years since then that we no longer see that film to be so intolerable as it was originally perceived? And the other story that always inspires me is the biography of Chelsea Elizabeth Manning, born as Bradley Edward Manning in Oklahoma, 1987. In his biography, we can read quite a few things and tell from it what really also is relevant for us. In an interview published by the New York Times, Manning says that from a very young age onwards, he perceived that in some indefinable way he was different from other children. Even so, or perhaps especially because of that, and in his search for normality, Manning decided to become a soldier and follow in his father's footsteps. His father was a soldier serving in the US Army, and he now had a repair shop for computers. And that is also where Manning grew up and where he spent a lot of his time playing video games. Manning's story, and the New York Times journalist describes it, elaborating on how for a long time in his life he was really um, depending on virtual, on, on video games. And eight days after he'd been released from prison where he'd spent seven years in isolation, he all of a sudden is confronted with an Xbox One, uh, one of the play consoles. When he joined the army, he already had a lot of know-how on informatics and IT. And uh, then in his work, archived pictures from Iraq and Afghanistan and the evasions there. He later on was posted in Iraq. And one day, when he was transported from one station to another, he witnessed an actual gunfight in the street that surprises and impresses him. And only at that moment, he says, only when I saw a body fall and die for the first time in my life, that's what he told the journalist, I realized that those were people, that they were people who died. And this sentence, this moment, he says, was when I stopped looking at archive pictures and actually seeing people behind it. And this sentence with me, Rita Segato, left an enormous impression because we can see here in Manning a true conversion, his first conversion. Because before, as a result of his addiction to video games and his subjection to the pedagogy of cruelty that comes across in video games, their de-empathic or psychopathic programming so far, life for Manning had been virtual, two-dimensional, cybernetic. And he then opens his eyes to human life. And later, he sends Julian Assange the largest package of confidential information ever extracted from US intelligence, the largest amount of confidential documents were sent to Assange by Manning who was then sentenced, as explained earlier, to solitary confinement in a maximum security prison. One of the last moves of Obama while still in office was to pardon him. And when he's released, 
which was quite recently, has already been transformed by what I interpret as his second conversion. He leaves prison as a woman. He lived the transition to sensitivity and femininity. And I believe that this story brings together the themes of the present. And in the figure of Manning, we find enclosed the mystery of programming and deprogramming, or, as I called it a while ago, of deprogramming as conversion. Or is Manning, the term, a name for the process of becoming man? pedagogy of cruelty and the mandate of masculinity. The masculinity mandate as a program of desensitization against life and this environment in which we are, this environment that we inhabit, which can be manipulated almost without borders and limits and without there being any limits. The subjectiveness to be overcome that is where we also have the important method according to which men are coined following the pattern of masculinity, maleness, and which also is the origin of the striving for possession. This paradigm, for example, is also shown in private and public security services, and I'd like to mention two examples for that. The training of the federal police in Argentina, according to Miguel Robles' uh, narrations, he was a high officer, follows the, the following pattern. There's a dog who lives together with a young soldier or policeman as a friend, as a companion, up until that policeman, say, when reaching the next career ladder, is forced to kill that dog. I'm not sure whether that is correct, but... Uh, Indeed, it would be fitting, fitting with the strategy of developing inhumane traits and traits in people. And then there's the great Ecuadorian economist Alberto Costa talking about his trauma, and that's as follows. When Alberto was on the military academy of his country, the young men were forced every morning to eat a raw onion on an empty stomach. Being tortured in order to torture, to see the proximity of death in order to kill, to endure one's own physical and moral suffering, to objectify oneself, to alienate one's own body, seeing yourself out of your own body and sensibility in order to then objectify others. And then there's more example of TV series, for example, which deny death. And I've never seen them in detail myself, but the examples are well known or have been told to me. Game of Thrones, the most expensive and uh, most viewed and highest rated television e event of all times on television. There's one of the central characters, Jon Snow, who dies in the middle of the story. And in the next season, he's resurrected. So there is no death. Then there are the Marvel superhero movies. The villain annihilates half of the living beings, half of the human population, but also other beings on the planet. And then in the conclusion of the saga, the superheroes manage to bring back all the dead people and amongst them some of the superheroes. They all return to life. So in reality, they had never been dead, but only blipped out erased, so to speak, and they can return. So again, there is no death. Then there's Star Wars. Or at least bi-dimensional death doesn't exist, to put it like that. Then there's Star Wars. Princess Leia returns in the last episode, the ninth. And by the way, that one I have seen, just as does the Emperor Palpatine the great villain, without explanation, just because it fit the plot. And so we return to the disbelief of death. The pandemic uncovers that communication 
cannot be simply be reduced to words, to the bi-dimensional. We believe we communicate because we talk, but in the life that we lead with the video conferences, sharing it with each other, that's where the image, the picture, is a two-dimensional projection and speech is at the center. But all of that is filtered through the audio functions of our computers. What we perceive is that something is missing. Something emerges which we hadn't known before. Some co-presence, a co-bodification, say. But there are other things missing. We see this impulse of the mass. Irrational, suicidal, and at the same time, reactionary, conservative, fascist. We are not listening to reason or to preferably preserving our body, possibly because this body doesn't even convince us that we're actually alive. We've got this intensive wish to be lost in a mass of people, because especially in order to feel alive, especially at a moment when control of our bodies seems so difficult and is so difficult. This thing called life makes it impossible to us to be and show solidarity, to be altruistic. On feminism and the reality of feminism in Latin America, let me say in conclusion that it has become a movement. It's free, out, roaming the streets now in every form, nice, beautiful, liberated, multidimensional. Warm, bodies binding in a state of liberation. Now in the pandemic, we are wearing masks. And this still goes to show that there is an altruistic pact, an altruistic alliance, and that there is life in the face of death. I'm done.